Hi guys, welcome back to the Max Spence Business Podcast. Today I have a very special guest. His name is Andrew Lees. He's actually a serial entrepreneur. Uh, it's great having you on the show, Andrew. It's awesome to be on. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Max. Uh, this is fun. Awesome, awesome. So why don't we jump right into this? Uh, why don't we jump into an intro about you know who you are and uh, sort of what got you into business? I also know you went to school for uh, engineering. So how, how did those sort of two passions sort of combine themselves? Yeah, so um, I knew as a kid, uh, when I was growing up, I knew that I wanted to, uh, to design things. I wanted to be an inventor. I knew that from a young age. My grandfather was an engineer. So um, he was always helping me work on pro you know, projects and building little things that moved around. And I was always inventing um, things like uh, things that could clean your um, kitchen table, you know, after you've eaten and clean the crumbs off or you know, I was always trying to figure out ways that I can make my life a little bit easier. And, and so I really liked coming up with gadgets that could help with those kind of things. So, um, so that's where it, it started and I got excited about um, tinkering with things and inventing. And then I realized, you know, and from the influence of my grandfather being a mechanical engineer, I was like, okay, being an engineer would be a good, that's, that's like the formal education that I can get to, to then be, you know, a legit inventor. Um, and then somewhere along the line, I kind of, in college, I just, I thought maybe I wanted to, to go into aerospace engineering and, and design, um, spacecraft and an aircraft. And I, you know, I, I still really love that kind of thing. Um, but I realized after college, when I worked for a large company that that was just not for me at all. So, and I realized that it just didn't matter what kind of large company it was, um, you know, that, that setting just wasn't, I just didn't really love it. I didn't really love the politics and trying to work around the corporate ladder and all that kind of thing. Um, so I thought, okay, well, the aerospace thing is probably out, but let me get back into doing what I love to do in the first place, which was, um, designing products. So I can't kind of came full circle and, and then, you know, got back into, into that, um, I started working for a product development firm outside of Philadelphia and um, and while they were focused on they weren't actually they didn't necessarily have a strict focus they were just uh, they were mechanical engineers good mechanical engineers for hire uh, but I really wanted to start working more with inventors and startups and and those are the kind of clients that I took on and then that's how from there I started my uh, product development business Stoke Ventures and you know so that's how I got into product development so kind of like kind of like full circle now I sort of help people take their inventions and bring them to market um, so it's it's kind of it's kind of cool I mean every project is a little different and it it gets me back to what I the reason that I wanted to be an engineer in the first place Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a very interesting, uh, that's a very interesting story. So uh, yeah, pr pretty much you, you were always inventing stuff sort of as a, cat, uh, as a kid and then sort of that brought into, you know, taking mechanical engineering. Uh, did you have like right. any sort of small businesses when you're younger or anything cool that you like, that was like a big invention that you actually did maybe in, you know, during high school or university or when you got out of university? Yeah. So um, I, I did, I actually kept a, a little book when I was a kid of of inventions um and i and i actually wrote a book called i think it was uh like um inventing from a kid's perspective uh, so i was i was always really um i was always really into that and, and actually reading through it i'm like wow i actually i had more insight then uh than i thought i would have you know so <laughs> i i understood a little bit more about business than i thought maybe i would at that age um so, so I think that got me, that also got me excited. Like I didn't realize it, but um, you know, I just kind of described how I got into engineering and then I, then I got into product development. Uh, but at the same time, I was sort of, I was excited about entrepreneurship and I guess I didn't even realize it, you know, I didn't, and I didn't realize the connection with invention and product, bringing a product to market and entrepreneurship and that whole, that whole thing. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, I did have a few little inventions, um, like a, a crumb cleaner that could, you know, clean your, your kitchen table. That's the one that I've, second time I've mentioned it, I, it's the one thing that, that pops into my head, actually. Um, and then a few other little things that I think I put into my book. 
Um, I'm not sure how novel they were. They were probably, <laughs> they may have been commercialized at the time. But then in college, I came up with an idea for, uh, I, I love surfing. I love uh, being in the water. So I, and I saw all these um, big waves. So I'm not a big wave surfer. I'm not that gutsy, but saw all these big wave surfing movies and guys, um, you know, potentially getting caught under waves under the water with their their leashes getting hung up on rocks and reef and stuff and it was a thing that that happened um and i thought ah it would be cool to come up with a way like a quick release leash kind of thing so you could just you know your leash leash would be attached to your ankle and it'd be really sturdy but if you needed to you could very quickly with your hand or your foot or something um release it without uh you know so that you weren't being held underwater so you didn't um you know have to try and uh, rip the leash or whatever so i came up with that idea in college and i worked with a professor on that and uh and it, it i made some prototypes and i i started learning at that point i started learning about 3d printing prototyping um you know testing and i was really so so new with it i think if i had uh, if I did it again, it would be a much less, much, much less painful process to get from point A to point B, but it was cool. I learned about everything from product design and engineering, prototyping, um, testing, and, uh, you know, the importance of different materials, the importance of, at that time, that was in 2006, and 3D printing was in its infancy, I mean, just nowhere close to where it is now. And so the materials, the parts I was getting, I was, I was actually frustrated because they weren't even close to the quality of parts you can get now. So like, I felt like my design was bad and it wasn't maybe that great, but also the parts were not, not good. So anyway, yeah, that's, that's sort of, um, I did have some ideas and some inventions that I worked on, um, through college and then, uh, and then I started, I think you and I were talking about offline, a company I started called Grass Racks, which is, I started that a few years after college and um, connected to, again, to my love of the ocean and board sports and biking and stuff. But um, there, it's a line of bamboo board racks, board, bike, and kayak, or board, bike, and ski racks that, that you can hang on your wall and store your, your gear. So um, I've been doing that for a while. And then that along with the product development part, I've kind of got service business on one hand and then actually developing and marketing and selling a product in the other hand. So it kind of gives me a unique perspective on the whole process. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So what, what would you say? So, um, okay. So you, you, the first one, when you, when you left the, the, you know, that design company and started your own sort of ventures, that was more from a consulting point, right? Right. Exactly. Okay. okay. And yep. then, and then after, but okay. But beforehand you actually had the grass racks, which was, you were running the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I did start that while I was still working for, um, as an employee for the consulting company in Philadelphia, I started grass racks. So, cause I always knew, um, from inventing at a young age and coming up with these ideas, I always knew that I wanted to, to bring something to market. Um, cause I had that entrepreneurial itch to, um, to, there were, I guess, three components to it. The, um, I, I really, I wanted to make money, <laughs> you know, I was very, very interested in that and the financial freedom that owning your own business can bring you. So that was one part of it. Then, um, there was the, just getting a product to, to market, like getting something out there that, that complete strangers buy and they like, you know, and they're interested in, like, I thought that, and I still love that concept. I mean, when, when some, when I, we get a new order, every single order we get for grass racks, I'm like, wow, I don't, I don't know this person. I didn't bribe them to buy my product. Like, this is so cool. So, um, so there's that part of it. And then there's also, um, for me, I also had the engineering and the technical part where I was excited about designing and engineering something. Um, and so, yeah, I started, uh, I started grass racks, uh, when I was before I started my consulting company, um, because I wanted to to bring a product to market and and have an understanding of what that process was like and and just just try something. So 
yeah, I've been running that ever since. Um, okay. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. In, the, in parallel the, with with my. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 I, yeah. The, like you're saying, that works really well because it's like it's not like you're just doing all the time consulting. It's like you're actually getting real world experience as well because yeah. it's like you're running your own business, so you know what's working, and what's not working, right? So uh, exactly, what, what I, exactly. What I'm really interested yep. in is um, so bringing taking uh, because you're actually the only person I've actually had. Well, the, yeah, the only person I've had on my podcast that does actually product design. Uh, so taking you know cool. product from inception. Um, and then yeah. uh, really designing it. And how, how, how do you go through that process, you know, from an idea in your head to actually building? Uh, well, actually, well, actually, yeah, j just saying that aloud, I, I just realized, well, that's like pretty much every entrepreneur, they have, they have an idea in their head and then they take it through product development to the process. But yeah. I like to actually hear the steps of it, um, of how you do it and your approaches of like, you know, you have, you have your idea and then you want to take it from you know your product to like you know is it like dry, writing it down on paper drawing it out uh and then sort of you know realizing it's practical and then going to the product prototypes and then production and then marketing and then sales and stuff yeah exactly that i mean that's a great question and um the way that i do it is uh, I, so a client will call me and i'll discuss their project with them um they'll usually, they don't have to, to usually give me a ton of information and like some will, they'll, they'll be at varying stages of, um, of their idea or the ideation stage where they'll have, they'll either just have an idea and they've literally just written a few notes about it. And with those notes and with the discussion, I can piece it together or they might have a sketch, which is always helpful. Um, or some, some people have actually made a crude prototype. You know, they've, they've sort of hacked something together. Um, and so that, that helps, that gives a visual, you know, so, um, so I'll basically the first step is to figure out what the product is, why, you know, what the problem is, what the problems are, um, that the product is solving and, you know, try, try and figure out why the, you know, why this, the client is interested in bringing this particular mod uh, product to market. Um, and then from there, I will I'll put a quote together and, and then we'll, we can start, you know, if everything looks good, then we can get going with the first, we'll start with the concept design. So um, I won't get into the full detail design until we have, till we make sure that like the form and the, the you know, the form looks good and make sure that I've got generally got uh, everything, the product looking the way that the, that the customer is interested in it looking. And then from there, we'll, we'll get into, I'll flesh out the details so we can work on prototypes and, um, and then, you know, talk about manufacturing from there. Um, so that's, if we're just the, if we're just focused on design, that's, that's, you know, one way to do it. Now, the only, the only thing with that is that, you know, that is kind of, um, designing in a silo maybe. So some clients already have done uh, their own product or their own market research. They've already put together business models. They've already got like some kind of a strategy together. And, and so in that case, if they've got all that figured out and they have a, a really good idea of how, how their product fits in the market and who their target audience is and all that stuff, then I can really hit the ground running with design. But if they, if they don't have that, and even if they, even if they don't have that, they might still want, they say, okay, this is what I need design. This is how I want it. That's it. You know, no questions asked, like just get this done. And maybe I'll have some suggestions that I think might, um, based on some market research that I, some basic market research I do that I might say, okay, this, this feature does maybe it doesn't make sense. It's a little too close to something that's already out there and that'll kind of help guide it. Um, but if they don't have a plan, I can also help them develop a plan, develop a strategy. And so some, so with, with many projects, that's actually a really good place to start. So we, they've got the product idea. We figure out why they want to develop this product, what their goals are, what the features are. And then I can actually help them with in-depth market research and business modeling, some financial modeling um, and marketing and development strategy that way they have an idea of the process the whole process they have an idea of the costs associated all along the way um, and then when we get into 
and then they can just execute on, on that strategy and product development is just part of that. So those are a couple of different ways that, that I can do it. I can either develop this, this in-depth strategy for clients from the beginning or, or we can jump right into product development. It just, it kind of depends on, on the client and what they, uh, how far along they are. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. And then, and then when you've, uh, so like, what do you sort of do to be like, to sort of see if this is a good idea or a bad idea? Like, you know, cause like, I, I know when you think you have an idea, it's like, oh, actually that yeah, is mm-hmm. a pretty interesting idea. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you might think a, a good idea, uh, you might think that a good idea is, is a bad idea and a bad idea is a good idea just because, you know, so I, I, I've talked to different people and they say, oh, well, you know, I had this idea for, you know, for some type of industry, but there's already people that are doing it, but you know, mm-hmm. they're just not doing it like just a little tiny tweaks. And that's what, you know, these little tiny tweaks can actually make a huge difference. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's, it's really tough to make that call. Um, I've looked at products that, that people have ideas that people brought to me. Actually, my first client for Stoke Ventures came to me with this fishing product idea. Um, it was, it's a device that retrieves your lure if you get it stuck in a tree. So if you're fishing and you get your lure stuck in a tree, you can use this, this little pocket size device that, um, goes on the end of your fishing rod or your, uh, if you're fly fishing. Um, it works with that as well and you can get your lure back and when he was explaining it to me I thought "Ooh, I don't know that doesn't doesn't seem like there'd be a huge market for that you know how many people are getting their lures stuck in trees well it turns out a lot like if you've ever gone fishing you've and I'm not a I don't really fish but um, I I worked with this this guy Dave for for years on this product and we worked on a on a follow-up product to it. Um, and, and it turns out that it's, there's a real demand for it and the market is pretty decent. I think it's a pretty good market. Um, so I was kind of shocked, you know, I didn't, I didn't really think, I mean, I for sure didn't turn the project down, uh, when we started, but I just, I was, I was surprised, I would have, I was surprised that it was as as successful as it has been, you know, and that, that there has been that kind of demand. And then some things seem like, they'd be perfect, you know, and they'd be um, really helpful and they'd fit some kind of need in the market, but they just sort of fall flat and that could be a bunch of different factors. Um, so it, it, it is really difficult to make that decision, um, but, but that's where the strategy comes in. That's where doing some homework in the beginning is so important. And if I'm not doing it, I at least want my clients to be to be doing it, to be doing some market research and figuring out, you know, um, part of, part of understanding, uh, where your product fits and if it's going to be successful is why are you doing it? You know, is it, you just had this problem and do other people have this problem? Um, is, is the problem big enough that it, you know, really requires a, either a, a brand new product or a modification on an existing product. And, you know, is it used, is that problem, does it come up frequently enough, you know, that people really like they need a solution on a pretty regular basis or is it like they might need the solution maybe once a year or something. So, so yeah, doing that in-depth market research, figuring out where the product could fit based on the competition and trying to understand your target audience and actually talking to them, asking them questions um, about about it. You've got to do that in the right way. Um, you know that that is really really important information that will uh, that will help you develop a strategy. And the first thing is like, is it is it even you know is it even something that's that's needed? Is it like like you said, you can make a small modification on an existing product and it can make a big impact. It could actually, that small modification can make a huge difference or it can just be a small modification and like nobody cares, you know? Um, and it's just not, it's not a big enough leap from an existing product for somebody to make the, the, the switch from, you know, doing whatever they're, they're already doing. So, oh, okay, okay. so really, yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I, I was just going to say like that, that's sort of, 
that I, I guess is sort of similar to like a, a lot of other things. Well, I, I can relate it to podcasting because there's some podcasts that I think like, oh, this podcast I think is going to do amazing. Like I think like I, I, I hmm. found it amazing. I found it really interesting. And I thought it was going to do like, I thought this one was going to blow up and then it doesn't blow up or mm -hmm. like nothing like it. It doesn't get as many views as another podcast that I thought was like, you know, that, that was it. But it really comes down to like, I didn't find it like I, I found it interesting, but I didn't find it interesting as other podcasts where, you know, that's that's like you said, man, like it comes down to like different markets and what just because you might not like for the fly fishing, you, you don't know, uh, you know, you're not much of a fisher. So you don't really know the market. You don't know what's like what's happening with it. But there's actually a lot of people yeah. that are actually really interested in it. So, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So um, I, I, I want to talk about so going into marketing now. So how, how do you approach marketing with your product? Uh, I know there's like a lot of different ways you can market now. There's like a lot of social media is very big. Uh, do, do you sort of handling the marketing yourself or is that sort of outside uh, outsourced to a marketing sort of firm or company? Yeah. So um, we do, and that's a great question because that's uh, marketing is, is kind of tricky, especially in the beginning. Um, you know, so we do all of our marketing ourselves, um, and it's myself and my business partner, Evan. We we both uh, both the co-founders of Grass Racks, and it's and it's mostly us. We've got some help with um, we've got some help with manufacturing and, and fulfillment and that kind of thing. But then, but on the marketing side, we're pretty much doing all that ourselves, and we really. Um, I, I think I would have liked to have grown the company like hindsight, I would have liked to have grown the company faster. And I think if we, what we knew when we started, um, compared to what we know now, it would have, we would have been able to, to really accelerate our growth. Uh, but it, because, and a lot, and that has a lot to do with the marketing. I mean, there's a lot of other mistakes in development and the logistics of getting a physical product out there. But, but yeah, the marketing is tough. Actually, a year ago, we started working with a company um, a marketing consulting company and they were pretty reasonably priced. They made, you know, they had a program that kind of worked for us with our budget. Like we don't have, um, at, at least at the time we didn't, we, we didn't have tens of thousands of dollars a month to, you know, to just pour into marketing without knowing whether or not we were going to get any return. Um, we did spend thousands of dollars with them and we made a whopping two sales from their effort. And it was like, the, the ROI was negative thousands of percent. It was, uh, it was amazing. So it, you know, and it probably, they, they either, they just didn't know what they were doing. They bit off more than they can chew. They didn't understand how to market our product or whatever, but, um, we, we decided, okay, we've, and at, to, to that point we had been doing it all ourselves, but we really thought, okay, we want to get into more paid ads and, um, and work with somebody who does that day in and day out. And it just, man, it was amazing. I actually, I knew more about it than they did. It seemed like, so we went back, we did it. Our, we started doing it ourselves again, but we got away from the paid ad stuff. Um, because what we learned while, while we didn't, uh, you know, we, while we didn't make barely made any sales with them, what we did learn was that in a relatively short amount of time, is that our product didn't, didn't lend itself to, um, to paid ads. Definitely not. We did some Google ads with them. Um, Google is expensive. Their ads are very expensive. So, you know, even, even as like a service bureau, like for, if I wanted to advertise for product development, the cost per click could be 12, 14, $15 per click. So, I mean, it, it just adds up really, really fast. So when you're first getting started, Google is, is really tough. They make it seem like, ah, it's just super easy. You know, you get, throw some money in and you get all this business. And it's, it's just, unless you really, really know what you're doing and maybe dial it into like a really small geographic group or something and test it, oh man, it's so tough. Um, Facebook and Instagram, uh, I would, if you're going to go with paid ads, I would go with Facebook and and figure that out because the the cost per click is a lot lower um and you can you know you can you can still really dial in uh who you're targeting so but what, what we realized with grass racks was that because it's we, we have a product that's kind of a, at a 
premium price point. Um, we, it's not something that people need to buy over and over again. So it's not consumable. It's not a subscription based thing. It's like most people buy a rack, you know, they've got four skateboards and they buy a rack and they hang it up and that's it. You know, they might refer our products to a friend. Maybe eventually they buy another one for like a surfboard or something. Um, but usually it's a one-time purchase. So what we realized that, that, um, we were, breaking even on our on our ads and it and that wasn't working for us because we didn't have any follow-up business but let's say you're selling coffee or something and you break even or maybe even lose a little money on your first purchase you you can do that that could work for that business model because you know that people are going to continue to buy as long as they like your product they're going to buy it over and over and over again so you'll make up that you know where you make your money is in the repeat business and we just didn't didn't have that. So our strategy then really um, kind of we had to take a step back and be a little creative and think, all right, well, if, if ads are, they don't necessarily work for our model, what can we do? And there's a couple of things. Um, one is content um, is just creating content around our products and around our industries that people want to, you know, that they're seeking and that they're, they could find on Google. I mean, that's actually how we get most of our sales now is just, just by putting content out there, putting some blogs out, reaching out to um, affiliates and um, reaching out to different websites who might, you know, throw a link up. If they've got a gear review, we could get, if we can get into a gear review that gives us a backlink that gives us some more traffic and gives us more sales. So um, it becomes more of like for us generating content doing outreach, reaching out to people who are in our industries who may be able to, to send us some traffic um, or maybe work with, uh, you know, like a surfboard manufacturer who if they make a sale, they refer our product like, hey, do you have somewhere to put that board, that, that brand new board that you just got? You should check these guys out. They make great racks. So um, we've had to get a little more creative than just pumping money into ads, but um, but for, for a lot of companies, ads work great though too. But yeah, that's, that's what we've been doing. We've been doing it ourselves for now. And if, as we scale up, we, we might, you know, hire some people to do some writing for us or, you know, maybe we could get back into paid ads or something. But I think if we honestly, for at least for grass racks, if we're going to spend money somewhere, we're going to spend money on help on getting people to help us write and create content, creating videos and creating blogs and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I would agree with that as well. I, I've, uh, you know, like with uh, like pay, pay, paid ads and sort of that stuff has their place, but with the, like, mm -hmm. you know, with social media and YouTube and TikTok and all these platforms where you can grow really quickly and have subscribers. Uh, yeah. it's, it's like, I, I always take the example of uh, the, have you heard of, you've probably heard of the black rifle coffee company at all. Um, it sounds familiar, but it, yeah. So yeah, I've heard of something, Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so they're like a they're a U.S. based company. They're uh, they're veteran owned, um, but they have a okay. pretty sizable uh, YouTube following and also social media following on Instagram and other platforms like that. Okay. And they like they they sell coffee and their coffees. Uh, you know, I I haven't personally tried it. Uh, I'm in the future. I'm wanting to try it. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, like it's 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 the same as like the majority of coffees out there it just kind of like and you know it's the same with uh uh with clothing as well it just comes down to brand and they've built an amazing brand around their coffee with the youtube content they put out and they put out some like really funny really yeah. interesting youtube content that get, actually sort of gets you involved they did they have like these they have like comedy sketches that they that they did it was like you know when that's like the last cup of coffee in the office or something it was just like this really funny comedy sketch they did hmm. uh and some other stuff like that but they that's built awesome. an amazing brand just from creating their own content uh and i actually think that's one of the best okay. things that like if, if you're going in to start a business one of the third, first things you should start doing is start creating your brand or content around what your your product is uh so th this sort of segues into uh yeah, segues I totally, into totally my next agree. question of um yeah so what 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 are some mistakes that people make at the beginning of product design that are, you know, that can sort of slow them down or something like that? You know, is there a way to say like, you know, there's a faster way of doing this sort of like when it comes to product design, like, you know, there's like some pitfalls that be like, these are the pitfalls that you should uh, avoid 
uh, and focus your time and energy on these different sort of aspects of it? Yeah. So the first thing is the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, my most successful clients are the ones who are uh, they're reasonable. Uh, they know what they want in the product, but they let the product developer do his thing, his or her thing. So I, I've had clients who um, actually going back to that first client with the fishing product, Dave, he was like the prototypical good, great client. Um, he knew exactly what he wanted. Like he understood fishing so well and what the product needed to do that um, I did some testing with it, but he could do testing because he was the one who understood it the best and he could actually, you know, I could build him a prototype. He goes and tests it and he knows exactly like to me, I might think, Oh, we're, we're there. We figured it out. And he might say, now we're close, but we need to tweak this one little thing over here. Um, so that's, that's one thing is it definitely helps to understand the, your product and really, really know, um, really understand exactly how you want it to function. Um, and, and, you know, know what you need, but also let the product developer do his thing because he really, he let me go. He didn't try and micromanage and, um, you know, he didn't try, he wasn't a pain in the butt about, about it. Um, so, so that's the first thing is, you know, is, is to know what you want, let the product developer do, do his or her thing. And because you're, you know, you're at the end of the day, you're hiring the product developer for his or her expertise in design, engineering, prototyping, manufacturing. So kind of like let them handle that. You know, I've had some clients who just, uh, they just kind of fight me through the process, you know, and I'm just like, Hey, at the end of the day, it's up to you. But I really, because of design constraints or manufacturing constraints here, we're, we have to, we really should do something another way or it's going to end up costing you in the end and some people listen um some people don't people who don't are less likely to be successful um and the people who you know who fight the process at all or just can't wrap their head around the the process of development um and the fact that it takes some time no matter what like it's it's just going to take time to get through you know your your design make sure that it works well um, and do testing and design iterations. There's always design iterations. Um, kind of want everybody who, who has an idea, who wants to go through the product development you know, process to know that there's always design iterations. No product developer on earth will get it right the first time. I mean, very, very rarely if that, that may happen every once in a while, but it's, there's almost always some modifications that need to happen that need to be made um and and it's really important that people understand that that it's just not a perfect process that it's an iterative process um so really the thing that can save the most time is just being reasonable understanding of the process working you know being able to to work with your product developer and and really know what you want out of the product so, I mean, I think that helps when, when, when clients go back and forth and they're like, yeah, I kind of want to do this or I want to change that. And they don't really know why. And, and they, they go back and forth between different features and different, you know, things that just, it drags the process out and it ends up being much less likely that the product will be successful. Um, partially because they don't even know why they're, why they want things. And, you know, if they don't know, oh, okay, how's the customer okay. supposed to understand that? Yeah. 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 So, so, so you'd say f first off is really like if, when, as soon as you have an idea, it's like really do your market research and understand the market where your product fits um, and really understand, really understand yeah. your idea and like understand how it's going to work in that, uh, that product uh, in that market. And then you'd go to like, exactly. you know, after you sort of got that refined that idea and did all that research, then you'd go to, you know, you'd go contact somebody as yourself uh, and start the product. Uh, design process and sort of just let them go and see what they like you know give them specifications of what you want but then sort of don't micromanage them let them produce it because they have the knowledge of you know we got to do it mm -hmm. like this just because this is going to save costs or you know this is actually going to work a lot better uh and then you know from that point on when you get that first product then you can start making some alterations to it and doing stuff like that yep yeah 
Exactly. And, and then understanding the process, um, you know, and that's, um, a lot of people don't understand the process, which makes sense because, you know, if you've never gone through it before, you wouldn't, you know, know what it, what it takes to, to design an engineer product and then to get it to market. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that need to happen and there's a lot of cost involved too. That's the other thing that, um, a lot of, a lot of clients will sort of, they're sort of dead in the water before they even started even from like a cost perspective because they don't like it, it's to, to develop a product it's at least thousands so, and and a lot of times tens of thousands of dollars to develop a, a physical product you know it's there's a lot or even you know if you're developing apps that's still tens of thousands of dollars to develop an app typically so um it it's an investment um, it can be well worth it. It's a risky investment. You know, not all businesses, not all, all, a lot of businesses do fail. A lot of products don't make it to market. Um, but it's such a, it's such a cool process. And when it does work, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so then you, so you've got the development cost, then there's prototyping in there too. And that's an additional cost. Um, and then where a lot of people sort of, hit a brick wall, if they can get through development, um, they manufacturing is, is even more. So if you've got a part or a product with like five parts, let's say five plastic parts, um, the, the tooling for that could be 50 to a hundred thousand dollars or, or maybe more, you know, and then you've got, you know, minimum order quantities and you're, so you're, there's a, there could be a big investment, you know, at the end of the day. Um, so understanding that and saying, okay, and that's, again, where the strategy comes into play. If you've got this plan and this strategy, and you know, okay, I've got $20,000 to spend. To, I've got $20,000 to, to invest in this product. I'm going to use that for um, product development and prototypes. And we're going to have a working, functioning product. And then we're going to take that and we're going to create video and pictures. And we're going to create, you know, um, a story around that. And then we're going to do a, a, a crowdfunding campaign, like with Kickstarter or Indiegogo or something like that. Um, you, maybe you do it yourself. Maybe you hire a company to, to help you with that. Uh, and then, or, or you say, all right, I'm going to go, I've got an investor lined up. I got somebody who can help me. I, they, they're going to want me to have some skin in the game and get the process started and have a, have like a working prototype before they work with me but maybe they can help take it through manufacturing, marketing and sales and, or, you know, um, that kind of thing. So just understanding if you understand the costs associated with bringing a product to market from the beginning, um, that makes it easier for you. That makes it easier for the people you work with. And you don't like get sticker shock when people send you quotes and you're like, Whoa, I, you know, I thought this was just going to be a few hundred bucks, you know? So, um, that, that definitely helps that helps speed things up and, you know, it keeps oh, okay, you from, okay. keeps okay, you awesome. from stalling out before you get started. Yeah. 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 That, that is very true. Like you said, and, and, and well, like, um, I, I really think that having, you know, those uh, like thinking about like, yes, this is going to cost money is really the deciding point for a lot of people is like, Hey, is this something that I really want to do? And two, mm -hmm. is this something that I actually believe is going to actually really affect the market? Um, and you yeah, know, I'm going to be able exactly. to make money off of this and sort of make a living and all that sort of stuff. And I'm putting in 30 or 40 or a hundred thousand dollars into this or lining up mm -hmm. an investor for it. Um, exactly. so I, I, I know we're coming to the end here. I, I just got one last yeah. question for you. So what would be some advice to, let's say, um, an entrepreneur that's maybe like, or, or, or want, want to like somebody who's wanting to become an entrepreneur, maybe in university or high school, that's like wanting to get started with their design. Um, and what would you say to them sort of like how, how, how would, how would, how would you sort of get started if you were that age again? Yeah. Um, that is a great question. Uh, because I had, I had the advantage when I was in college of, I was a mechanical engineer, so I already had design some design experience, although I didn't have nearly the amount of like design and CAD experience that I do now, because there's a lot of, uh, engineering schools just, you know, theory, you're just, you know, sitting there grinding through equations like 90% of the time. So I do way less of that, way more CAD design, but that even, you know, having that background gave me an advantage. 
um, with design. And then I also had, I was able to um, finagle my way in the mechanical engineering department to get some free prototypes made from their um, really ancient old 3D printer. Uh, but if you're just starting out and you don't have, you know, and, and even with that, even with those resources, it's not like it set me like that product didn't, didn't go anywhere, you know, that I was working on then. So, you know, it, it helped me to get to where I am, but it, it didn't actually get anywhere. Um, but if I'm, if I'm just starting out and I don't have those, you know, those kind of resources, um, you know, I, and if, if you do have some money set aside, you know, I would definitely, and you, you're not technical and you can't design, I would definitely reach out to a product development company and, and start there. At least get a concept level design made. So you have an idea of what the product is going to look and feel, you know, kind of look like, um, even if it doesn't have all the, uh, the, the manufacturing details designed into it, because the concept level, like, I don't, some companies might not do this, but this is something that I offer is, so you've got the detail of product development, detail design, which is the, um, the exact design that needs to be, uh, that will be manufactured. So there's a lot, a lot of work in, involved with that just to make sure that all the features of the product can be manufactured. But then for less money, you know, a decent amount less money, you can, I can do a concept level design. And that just gives you an idea of, you know, it, it kind of brings your idea out into 3D space. It doesn't have all the manufacturing details in there, but it lets you at least visualize it and lets you get a start. It might, it, it should help you get a patent, uh, pitch to investors, you know, try to get some, you know, try to get some traction with it. Um, and then, you know, and, and really the first, the, it all comes down at the end of the day to figuring out how are you going to fund, you know, fund it. Like, how are you going to get it? Um, how are you going to get it designed? How are you going to get it manufactured? How are you going to market and sell it? And all those steps take, take capital. So, so yeah, the first thing could be if you've got some money put aside, get it, get a concept design from somebody from a product developer and then take it to somebody and demonstrate it to them, you know, say, Hey, this is the product. This is what it does. This is what it would look like. And they might be able to give you money to, to go ahead, you know, and, and get the rest of, uh, go through the rest of development and everything. Um, and so those early stage, those early, early stage investors are going to be angel investors. They're going to be people who, um, could be really where you're going to get your first money is your, your seed capital is typically, um, from either friends and family or and some people feel uncomfortable with that. And I totally get it. That's tough. I never, never wanted to go that route. Um, or they find somebody like an angel investor. Um, and, and you can literally just Google that and find angel investors in your area. Um, people who are like looking for something to invest in, it's usually a, a lot less money. They're not investing millions in. They're investing tens of thousands, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars max. And, uh, and they don't have, it's not like, um, you know, they don't have, they, they have a lot more risk, right? But they also aren't laying out millions of dollars. They're trying to help you get started. The one thing I will say, the one thing that I would not do is don't get a bank loan. Don't sell all of your stuff. Don't like, you know, like, um, don't go broke trying to do it because it's, it's still risky. Like I think a lot of people, some people come to me and say, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm working, um, I'm working my nine to five for the next year or so. But then man, as soon as this hits, this is, um, I'm done. I'm out, of, I'm out of there. You know, I'm not going to have to work anymore. And I, and I think that's going to happen. And, you know, sometimes they think it's going to happen in a few months, like this product is going to take off and then I'm good, but it, it usually takes longer than that. So have a good backup plan. Uh, don't sell all your stuff. Don't get a bank loan Try get, you know, because the only thing guaranteed with that is that you have to pay it back. So friends and family money, um, angel investing, you know, angel investors try, or, you know, and if you have a little money set aside already, try and get a concept uh, 
design so you can get started. Yeah. I hope that, uh, I hope that I, was kind of clear enough. I was bouncing around a little bit there, but no, 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 <laughs> that, 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 that's perfect. Yeah. So just to like, sort of, um, go over those points again, it's pretty much get your idea down, get it written down, get it like centralized, uh, and then go to sort of find how you're going to get it funded. Right. Um, and, and yep. I, actually, I agree with you with that as well as like, when you go to the bank, uh, you, you get the money, but you don't get like a partnership or with an angel investor. The thing is with an angel investor is most likely they're an entrepreneur theirself or they have, uh, exactly. you know, they already have a business experience or something, or they have some sort of experience mm-hmm. that they can bring to the table. So yeah, they, they might want, you know, um, equity in the company, but you know, to get it funded, but you're also going to have this whole side of like business experience and all this other stuff which is going to be really, really important to, you know, bringing that yep. product that you're designing to actual market. So exactly. I, I, yeah. I, I actually a hundred percent agree with you on that is with, with the uh, angel investors or, you know, private equity firm or something like of that nature, uh, that yeah. you can sort of, or a partnership or something. So, part, right. I forgot to mention a partnership. That's also, that's actually kind of how we got grass racks going in the, in the early, early stages. We actually used to be three of us. Um, and we got to the point where um, that third partner who helped us, you know, he kind of helped us in the beginning. It, it kind of, we, our, our vision didn't align a couple of years in. So we parted ways uh, with him, which was fine. That's good. Like we're, we're good friends, but it, it just, you know, business wise, it wasn't working out. Um, but he did help us get started financially in the, in the beginning. And, and that's really important. So he was kind of like, um, he was sort of uh, a strategic part partner. So besides the, you know, just having money to pay for some things that we needed in the beginning, um, he had some space where we could work out of and that kind of thing. So that was strategic for us because it gave us a place to work. I would be, if I did it again, um, uh, no offense to him at all, <laughs> but if he ever listens to the show, but I would, I would be even more strategic with the partner that I choose. So I would, uh, he was, he was a good business guy. He knew B to C type or sorry, B to B type business, like business to business. He knew sales for that, that kind of business, but for business to consumer, he really didn't know at all. Um, and so I would find somebody, if you're developing a product and you're trying to sell it to customers, find somebody who has some experience with that who has some, you know, if they have some capital and they have experience, it's like, you know, that's, that's a perfect fit because they can, you know, give you some capital to get started, but then they can also give you some, you know, guidance. And that's, that's really huge. Um, and then the other thing I didn't mention was, you know, develop a, put t- together a strategy, put together a plan, whether you do it or have somebody else help you with that, but put together a plan because um, even if you hire somebody to do it, you'll spend a little money um, but, and you may realize that, that the product is just not a good fit for the market, but at least, you know, that without spending a lot more money, you know, you might decide, okay, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about this product and why it won't work, but I'm going to do something else and t- completely different. Or I just make a little modif this, this plan, this strategy shows me that I just need to make a slight modification and then I can keep going with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I like that as well. Yeah. It's like re- really picking your strategic partner is really, really important. And, uh, you know, if, if you're at the beginning, you might think that you not ha- you, you don't have much value you have to go with the first person you sort of find, but yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, just because you don't have any, like you don't have any knowledge or any experience of it, you do have a lot of value. So understanding your value and yeah. making sure that like, Another thing too is like when you're going to get funding, it's not like taking the funding that anybody can give you. It's more you're interviewing them as well. You're trying to find the right match. And that's more important than just getting the money is making sure that you're also yeah. getting that strategic partnership as well. Yep. Yeah. I mean, be careful about where you're taking money from and, you know, make sure that, um, that, you know, if possible, they don't just have money that they have, you know, that they have some experience they can help you with because, if they don't have any experience with the kind of business that you're running, that you're trying to start, um, it can be frustrating on both sides because they can give you money and then be frustrated with why it's not working as fast as they thought, because they have no idea how fast it should work and they have no idea what to tell you to help it go any faster. So then 
they can get frustrated. You're frustrated because, you know, they might start getting a little stingy with the money and you're like, Hey, I either need help or money or both, you know? And it's like, if you're not getting help and then they start getting frustrated and they start tightening the purse strings before the business has a chance to take off, it can, it can just, you know, stall. Um, and that is kind of what, what almost happened to us with grass racks actually, um, almost exactly. But luckily we were bouncing off the runway and luckily at the last second, right before we parted ways with this other partner, we just kind of just started taking off. So just enough that we, we could, um, Evan and I could do it ourselves and we could, you know, start to be self-sufficient, like the, you know, the business itself was the revenue coming in was paying the bills. And so that was at that point, we were like, okay, I think we're good, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really, really good to, to know who you're getting into business with and, uh, and trust them. And so that's yeah. very important. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with you is that I, I agree with you with, with, with that. So, um, I know we're coming to the end here. Uh, where can people actually find out more yeah. about you? Uh, you know, let's say your personal brand, but also your company and also your, uh, the podcast that you host. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there, <laughs> there is a kind of a lot going on. Uh, but so the grass racks is grassracks.com. Um, G R A S S R A C K S.com. That's the, the product that we were talking about before. Um, Stoke Ventures, um, S-T-O-K-E-V-N-T-U-R-E-S.com. That's the that's my product development business. Um, and then I also have a dedicated website for, for our strategy service, which is stokestrategies.com. And then the podcast I do is, um, which we were, you and I were talking about offline a little bit, do a podcast with, uh, with a guy, Clint McPherson, um, and that is called That Entrepreneur Life. So you can find that on iTunes or anywhere, you know, you, you listen to podcasts. So that, that one is That Entrepreneur Life and um, thatentrepreneurlife.com is the website. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Andrew. And uh, to the listeners, thank you guys. If, if you've made it this far, thank you for listening. Uh, you know, go check out his stuff and also uh, subscribe to this uh, podcast if you like what I'm doing and the content that I'm putting out. Uh, again, it was great having you on, Andrew. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Max. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on and, you know, kind of talk to you and, and um, yeah, love it.